Great. Well, welcome everybody. Um, as you may know, Michael's mother died and he is uh, on, on his way uh, to that uh, service. The, um, today we're going to be mostly focused on housing and eviction issues. And uh, I welcome everybody. It's good to have you. We will have Becca joining us shortly. Um, and Josh, if you could join us, we're gonna start with just an update on yesterday's executive order and to understand from our commissioner of, uh, of housing and uh, community development, whether there is any implication <laughs> in that uh, and anything we should understand or any help he needs from a in any kind of legislative action. Yes, thank you. This is uh, Josh Hanford here, Commissioner of Housing and Community Development. Um, I also coordinated uh, with the Commissioner of Travel and Tourism last night. Um, since much of this latest uh, addendum to the executive order uh, deals with lodging properties, vacation rentals, um, and so forth, um, to understand from her perspective, um, you know, what's going on and, the, and what the ramifications are here. Um, what I can tell you is that all of these properties, lodging, Airbnbs, have, if they're housing uh, essential workers, anyone involved in the response, they are open and available to provide that lodging. Um, in fact, we daily receive uh, inquiries about, I'm in this situation and um, can I continue to extend my Airbnb rental or I'm looking to, I'm in the middle of leases, my lease expires, you know, the end of this month, you know, such as today, and will I be allowed to transfer to another property to continue? Um, you know, and the answer to, to all those is, is yes, um, as long as they're not just here for some sort of vacationing purposes. Uh, that's essentially what has been shut off. Um, and the online, you know, short-term rental sites have recently put up um, info right on the, the registration pages on their websites, you know, stating that they're not taking uh, reservations for anything other than uh, essential workers uh, related to the, the COVID response. Um, and, and some of these properties, lodging properties, hotels, motels have been critical to this response. They're housing folks that have been transferred from homeless shelters or other vulnerable populations um, in coordination with the state. So I'm not sure if you have specific questions. Um, you know, there has been some recent sort of, and, and I don't want to say enforcement, but um, a check to see how properties are complying with this, this order uh, by the state police and others. Um, and they've found you know, decent compliance, but there's more education that's needed um, and suspect as people understand uh, what's going on here and, and the needs for these properties to only be available for essential workers, folks that have come to our area to help with the situation and for folks that need to be, um, you know, self-isolate, uh, you know, removed sort of from their regular activities that that's where these uh, lodging properties are, are to be used and, and not for uh, vacation rentals. So uh, something had come up yesterday, e evidently there are some landlords who have been moving to evict essential workers, nurses or doctors that they're uh, concerned about the spread of the disease uh, in their properties. Are you identifying lodging facilities close to places where essential workers are, traveling essential workers we're really talking about, um, so that people will, or, or, you know, how do we, do, do you need anything from us or can you manage all this pretty much on, uh, on your own at the moment? Or I, I guess that's where the, some of the concern had been raised. Um. You know, I, ha I have not heard that uh, exact experience expressed to us. Uh, that would be highly illegal. Um, um, and evictions aren't happening at, at this point. Um, actual removal from properties by the courts. So 
Um, I, yeah. I, we've responded to a few situations where um, a, a mobile home park owner um, is concerned about a wholesale lack of uh, rent payments, le lease lot payments from all of their residents and how they're supposed to respond to that since they, you know, still need to provide services, you know, water, sewer, et cetera. And, you know, some sort of frustration on their part that, you know, what could they do? Could they put a chain across the, the entrance and, and block people since no one's paying him? And, you know, we've had our, uh, some legal counsel, you know, involved in that and, and suggest that you absolutely cannot do that. Um, and, you know, I think it's more of um, landlords expressing frustration that um, it, it, even as they hear about pending, you know, eviction moratorium orders and whatnot, that, you know, they're feeling that if people have any ability to pay, they should. Um, you know, there is um, increased workers on uh, unemployment insurance, you know, coming. There is checks from the federal government coming and that, um you know, shelter and food are among some of the first things that folks should use their limited resources to provide and uh, app, uh, any sort of suggestion that those don't people don't need to pay, even if they can, is of great concern to them. Um, it'd be like, you know, telling grocery stores, yes, they open and people can take food, but they don't have to pay. They're, they're, they're concerned about that sort of message and the greater impact that that has on the whole housing industry if there's a wholesale stop payment from, from folks. Um, but w we have not um, heard landlords suggesting they're going to kick people out because they might be, um, you know, okay. have well, the that, virus. That, that would be illegal. That was a concern that had come up with traveling uh, nurses. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad you haven't. And uh, I know you testified, I believe you testified in the House on the bill that we're about to discuss with David. So if you if No, you wanted, the House has not the House has not had me in to testify. Are you wanting to testify on that when it comes to us? Um if, yeah. all the, Okay, right. Terrific. I, I so, testified briefly last week and, and followed up. Uh, I know Senator Sorokin's, you know, dealing with some um, you know, challenging times right now himself. Um I did send, he asked me for a follow-up of sort of a summary since my testimony um, in your committee last week was at the very end um, of a long group of folks testifying uh, to follow up with the summary. And I did send him that, you know, with, with several points that, um, you know, we would like to make about the, the challenges of a, a, a wholesale uh, moratorium on, uh, on evictions and foreclosures. And, and I did send him that. Great. Uh, we will we will uh, weigh in with that as we go through this because I I I think uh, anyway we're about to take that up. So we'll so anything committee anybody have a, a any fallout on the uh, executive order yesterday that uh, one, uh, uh, for uh, the commissioner and that is of people who have uh, had their stays at uh, hotels and short term rentals terminated. Uh, have there been any, in effect, results of adding to the homeless population by virtue of that? Any reports of that? Uh, Senator, I, I, I'm not aware of that. We dealt with two situations of uh, short-term rentals um, needing to be extended yesterday for, for folks that, you know, they were here um, uh, under um, different, they weren't here just vacationing, but they were in a short-term rental and they needed to continue to stay. You know, uh, one case, someone was involved in some medical procedures here in Vermont, unrelated to COVID-19. They were, you know, um, in, in compromised situation and could not go back to their home state. And we were able to provide that guidance that they, they had another short-term rental that was available to them right in the community they were staying in and gave them guidance that yes, they, could continue to stay that was not um, in violation of the order. And so, you know, we've dealt with various situations like that, but have not heard of anyone that said they couldn't find um, uh, um, new accommodations that met their need and, and they were being, you know, essentially cast to the, the homeless population. We, we have not heard that. So Josh, uh, just to follow up on that, if we hear uh, anything, 
else that crops up, we should be in touch with you, I assume. Yes, they can, they can um, come through me. They can come through. It's better to come through the, the agency's general um, COVID email. Uh, and then we divide those up by, you know, industry and sector. Um, you know, Sean Gilpin uh, fields a lot of these. I, I field um, some of these if they have, they need some sort of uh, legal um, sort of not advice or opinion in, in the, the legal way, but uh, there, there's some tricky circumstances. Uh, the agency general counsel responds. It's pretty much a, a all hands on deck um, response to all the emails and phone calls that come into our agency. Okay, great. So what sort of a standard do you have as far as response? Uh, when a person uh, goes into your uh, email line uh, with a question, say, guys, I'm out of housing, how quickly are you able to get a response back? Is there any kind of a standard that you set? Uh, we're, we're trying to get back to everyone within 24 hours. Um, you know, that, that some of these housing situations where, you know, they're, they're really in, a, in a, um, a situation where they need a, a response soon. You know, there were two that came in last night and they've already been dealt with by this morning. Um, also, you know, some of these get ris uh, rise right up to um, uh, Commissioner Sherling, Mike Sherling, public safety, um, because there, um, if there's any sort of complaints about, you know, someone will be, you know, being threatened with uh, eviction or not being allowed to stay. Uh, two of these cases um, were, were, were actually from um, the public safety um, sort of avenue and kick to us that we were able to, to deal with immediately. Um, you know, the majority of our inquiries are related to businesses trying to understand if they meet the definition of essential um, and looking for further guidance about their operations. Um, and, and, you know, and there's thousands of those. And so those are the ones that are taking longer than, you know, 24 hours to respond to. Great. Thank you. So yeah, just Cheryl. a quick clarification. So Josh, for RV park owners, if they are um, adding to the housing for COVID related um, tenants, then they can have their parks open. But if they are not, they're not essential businesses. Is that- Absolutely, you are 100% correct. And that's what's tricky here is people, you know, if, if, if folks are trying to open up their, you know, uh, seasonal RV parks or other, you know, seasonal lodging, you know, on the lakes or whatnot, and they're saying they're doing it for um, these sort of workers or, or, or essential sort of services now, you know, it, that becomes a, a challenge to, to literally police if people are going to violate that. But there are um, uh, sort of, um, you know, random checks going on. Um, in coordination with public safety to verify that um, that's what is happening. Okay, thanks. Thank so, uh, yeah, because great. Thank you, Josh. Uh, more to follow on the house bill, but we're gonna begin our work on that with David, I think right now, if that's okay. Thanks, thanks, Josh. You're welcome, thank you. Yep. Thanks for continuing your important work under these circumstances as well. And Back Back at you, David. Hello, David Hall. It's good to see you. Uh, <clears throat> we have the house, as we all know, is working, has been working, uh, and they're, they, they meet tomorrow. They have been working on this big bill that uh, has a, a lot of in it. But for us, on <clears throat> draft point 8.1, is that what we're looking at, David? Yes. Would you be kind enough to walk us through it? Uh, the plan at the moment is to have them pass this and get this to us and ASAP, and that we would then be adding things uh, like commercial rental issues and, and issues they haven't been able to take up necessarily or that aren't in their jurisdiction, but that are in ours. So uh, our hope today is to begin to understand it and to hear from the various uh, uh, stakeholders uh, who we've heard from a bit already, but um, uh, so that we can be ready to rock and roll when the bill comes to us and to be thinking about what we want to be adding to it. 
So do you, okay. hi Becca, welcome to Becca. Uh, so David, how would you like us to proceed? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, good. I can't see, I can't see you anymore because somehow the, well, we have the bill up. Oh, I am sharing my screen. Are you able to see the language? Yes. yes. Yeah. And the and the bill is also on, if you have another, oh, I guess, right. If people didn't print it out, that's a challenge. Um, if I share my screen, I hope you can see it and it'll allow me to scroll through it. Yeah. Great. Yeah, perfect. And is this is the same document that you sent us earlier today. Is that yeah. correct? It's, yeah. Uh, should have yesterday evening. 8.1. 8.1. Got it. Okay, um, so to the extent we have a record, uh, I'm David Hall, Legislative Council, uh, I staff housing and other issues. So as uh, uh, Senator Clarkson mentioned, this is a bill that the House General Committee has been working on. It really has two parts to it. The first six sections are all Damien stuff for um, leave and UI and other such things. So. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm of no help to you there. And if you have questions on those parts, you'll have to ask him. Right, and my understanding is much of it now, given the federal action may be moot. Uh, so, that could be the case, I don't actually know. Yeah, and so we're going to be starting, I believe on page seven with section seven. That is correct. So uh, if you are on page seven of 16, um, you'll see here section seven. So right now this bill has a live appropriation. Uh, it's a placeholder amount of $5 million from the general fund to DCF to provide emergency housing related assistance pursuant to section eight. Um, I've said a number of times before, uh, you know, this is sort of the starting number. I have no idea what the number is. I don't know if it goes in this bill or in a budget bill, but right now seven and eight are tied together. Seven being the money, eight being the services. Got, got it. So and on to uh, in your, we'll chat about this as we proceed, but uh, in your first filtering through an analysis of what's available in the federal stimulus uh, package or the federal relief package, uh, I, I guess one of our questions will be, is money like this available for these purposes in that bill? So th that's a question out there as we go through. Well, okay. let me interrupt for just a second with a question regarding the technology. Is this bill uh, or the version of it, is it up on the committee's website so that the public yes. can be looking at it? Because yes. I looked today and I couldn't find it. Uh, maybe I missed it. No, um, I, I actually sent it to you all and to Faith, uh, but generally I wait until the direction of a member to have it posted on the website. So, um, uh, now, sorry, that that it's, it's, now that it's out here and being displayed in the world, it's a public document and it's okay to post it. Uh, so I, now I, it, I it think should be posted. Generally, we don't post things until we take them up. So we're going to post it now, I hope, and it is being taken up and it's on the screen. Mm -hmm. It is a public document. Excuse me, excuse me, this is Denise. Um, Senator Brock, sometimes you have to close down uh, that particular site then open it back up for the most recent postings um, to pop up. Okay. That's what I, you, that's what I had to do. Okay. Okay, David, see, sorry to interrupt. No worries. Okay, so the services in section eight, these are based basically uh, exclusively on the types of services that are being provided currently under the HOP programs. So, um, you know, I, I pulled all these from reports and information uh, about what they do now, and that's, that's the basis of the language. So you'll see in subsection A here, DCF in coordination with DHCD and VHCB, other appropriate partners as necessary, shall adopt policies and procedures to administer funding for housing related emergency relief that is specifically necessitated by the spread of COVID-19. That includes 
housing search and placement, housing stability, case management, landlord tenant mediation, follow up and supportive services to maintain housing, financial assistance for security deposits and rental payments, rental arrears, short term rental assistance, and the purchase or lease of existing housing units for purposes of isolation or quarantine related to COVID 19. Under BDCF shall develop a process for outreach to community partners, landlord, tenants, two, develop an expedited application process for emergency relief, three, develop criteria for prioritizing emergency funding based on the income of applicants, projected duration, severity of the statewide need for assistance and other relevant factors. Under C, uh, DCF shall maintain adequate records and data concerning funding it provides pursuant to the section and make that information available to the General Assembly. And under D, DCF and DHCD shall provide information, technical assistance, and necessary guidance to homeless shelters, community housing partners, and landlord and tenant associations concerning the resources and requirements of this act, as well as relevant existing resources. So uh, the, let, me, let me finish by saying um, this subsection eight is all policy all the time, who does it, what they do, time frame, data, reporting, amount of money for what purpose and the amount of money total are all obviously purely policy decisions for you. Thank you. And any questions on this section? But maybe we we just go all the way through and then come back unless we have specific questions. Uh, committee, do we have any yeah. questions on this section? Want me to shut this off? Yeah, because this is um, this deals with landlord tenant. I thought you might be interested. Sorry, who who's speaking? I think that was Michael. Michael, was that you? Chris, somebody. It's it was, but I'm signing off. Sorry. I think he signed off, Allison. Okay. He, I know he was going to listen as he drove. So um, anyway, any, any questions so far? Okay. David, why don't you keep going? Sure. Um, I'm going to skip. Well, let me just quickly tell you that the way that this draft has developed is it started in 1.1 1 .1, um, with some placeholder pieces about landlord tenant utilities and mortgages, um, creating moratoria for those three particular purposes, evictions, foreclosures, utility shutoffs. Um, so, Subsequent to that, the draft has developed more fully, and I'm going to skip ahead to what is the new section nine about uh, current and uh, pending and future actions for ejectments and foreclosures. Um, right now, uh, it's, it's up in the air as far as I know whether people are going to pursue a moratorium on utility uh, shutoffs. My understanding is that the Public Utilities Commission has already done that by emergency rule. Right. Um, but, you know, whether you wanted something like that in this bill, up to you. Uh, so far, I've not heard any testimony on that issue. So June, Juden didn't testify in house? N not that I heard. Okay. Um, so I'm going to move ahead to the bottom of page 10. And uh, this is language based on an original Vermont legal aid proposal. That's why it's flagged as such, but they have been working cooperatively um, with Angela and others in the community to come up with consensus language. And um, I think it's fair to say 99% of this is agreed upon. There's just one outstanding piece on sort of emergency relief that I'd like to talk about at the end. Um, yeah. But if I can proceed with this in section nine, at, at its highest level, what section nine does is create uh, or define what we consider to be the, an emergency period. And then uh, it says what happens during that emergency period with respect to ejectment actions, 
also known as evictions and foreclosures. So let me stress that right now this draft does include both evictions and foreclosure actions. And while the language concerning ejectments, landlord tenant law is uh, consensus, legal aid, apartment owners, others, um, the language concerning foreclosures is not. And in fact, I think you've heard testimony from Chris Delia and from VHFA um, that right now they do not support the statutory moratorium on foreclosure proceedings. Everybody clear on that? Yeah, so the new section nine still has foreclosures in it. Yes. And when you say I'm, okay, so, okay. All right. Go for so, it. Big picture, you see what the subject matters uh, that are addressed here. Um, another big picture, issue sort of what is the construct and essentially this wants to deal during the emergency period with what happens to actions that are already pending and what happens with actions that would be new and so it the structure is to kind of work through all of those uh, permutations in the context of ejectments and foreclosures so you'll see on page 11 of 16 in the definitions Right now, the emergency period is defined as the period beginning with the governor's declaration of a state of emergency on March 13th, arising from COVID-19, and ending 30 days after the governor terminates the state of emergency by declaration. So a couple of things to unpack there. As we are defining it, this emergency period uh, has to begin and end with the declaration, it's already begun, but the governor will actually have to end the state of emergency by declaration to sort of turn off this act. And then that emergency period would extend for another 30 days beyond that declaration. Um, one more definition of foreclosure. It means a foreclosure action brought under 12 VSA chapter 172 against a dwelling house as defined in 12 VSA 4. To. That's just to make sure we're talking about a residential property. So I guess that's the third thing I want to point out uh, big picture wise. Right now, there is an open question about commercial leases and um, right. whatever you decide, either way, whether you want to address them or not, I think you need to say that clearly. I, I would agree, and I think that the House is going to be looking to us to address the commercial aspect uh, of, of this area. Okay, so let me just sort of frame that for you. We have 9 VSA Chapter 137 residential rental agreements that set sort of the minimum statutory standards for landlord-tenant relationships in the context of a lease agreement. And um, for the most part, those cannot be waived. They provide uh, protections and processes for both landlord and tenant from the origination of a tenancy through its termination and ejectment action or otherwise. Um, as you probably are well aware, that's quite prescriptive. Lots of rules in there governing both landlords and tenants. We do not have a comparable chapter in law that governs commercial leases in that way. Um, commercial leases are private agreements. They are usually more complicated, a lot more money involved. Um, they are resolved first through negotiation and then through uh, mediation or court process. Usually um, the, the one piece we do have uh, in statute that governs all property matters as far as retaking possession is this ejectment chapter. So that does apply. Um, but that's really the court procedure. That's not, uh, you know, it's not, ways. it's not the process leading up to the court action. Right. So, and that is all, that is all governed commercially by contract. Yes. Yes. There are some states that do have more prescription around commercial leases. We are not one of them. Um, so here in duties, two important things. Um, this section does not relieve a tenant of the obligation to pay rent. 
under chapter 137. Or, and this section does not relieve a borrower under a residential loan agreement of the obligation to make timely payments pursuant to the terms of the loan agreement. Right. Um, that is written intentionally that way, pursuant to the terms of the loan agreement, because it is possible under either uh, some provisions in the federal uh, actions that have happened or just by private arrangement that the terms of loan agreements may change, may change permanently, may change temporarily. So to the extent they do, um, it would still govern. Any questions there? So C, subsection C at the bottom of page 11 would govern pending foreclosure and ejectment actions. So these are actions that have already been filed. Under one, upon the effective date of the act, all pending actions for ejectment under 12 U.S.A. chapter 169 actions for foreclosure under 12 VSA chapter 172 and outstanding orders in those actions are stayed until the end of the emergency period. And two, of course- Sorry, state, so, sorry may I just yep. ask a question here? Mm -hmm. So here we, you know, we have two different sort of def, so the definition of the emergency period includes the 30 days afterwards. That's correct. Right, got it, okay, answers my own question. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So under two, a court before which any one of these matters would be pending shall issue necessary orders and provide notice to the parties of the stay not later than five days after the effective date of this act. So basically, if this passes, then courts will, within five days, take whatever action they need to hit pause on these pending actions. Presuming the courts can deal with the load that they will be given at that moment. Sure. I mean, um, you know, they could just adopt an across the board order that says everything's on pause until the end of the emergency period. So rather than having to dispose of each action individually. Right. Um, under D, new foreclosure and ejectment actions. So during the emergency period, a landlord may commence an ejectment action pursuant to chapter 137 and chapter 169, and a residential mortgage lender may commence a foreclosure action pursuant to 12 VSA chapter 172, subject to the following. So under one here, the plaintiff may commence the action only by filing with the civil division of the superior court, not by service. Under two, the court shall stay the action as of the date of filing until the end of the emergency period. Three, the plaintiff shall not attempt to serve and a sheriff or constable shall not serve any civil process. And four, the deadline for completing service of process under rule 60, um, excuse me, under rule three will be 60 days after the emergency period ends. So these are new actions. There's a lot going on there. Let me yeah. say it to you in plain English, okay? What this Thank means, <laughs> what this, what this means <laughs> is that you can initiate an action for ejectment or foreclosure, okay? But to do that, you have to go to court. You have to file it with the court. You can't just send the papers to the defendant. You have to actually do a court filing. As soon as it comes in, the court will stay the action. There will not be service of process during this period. And then once the emergency period ends, the normal 60 day period for completing service of process of an action will start as of the date the emergency period ends, okay? So we are literally just, we're saying while you may be able to start an action, it will be paused until the end of the emergency period. And we'll until, and that includes again, the 30 days after the emergency order is that's correct so it 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 sort of similar to judge tours uh order yesterday that ends up almost being the equivalent of 90 days mm -hmm. well so the 90 days would be the end of the service period so don't get uh confused by that you have the emergency period as we've defined it, 
That's the state of emergency declaration and then 30 days after. Once that right. period ends, consistent with the current court rule, you have 60 days to complete your service of process. So that's what we have going on in D4. So question for on, on line nine, not it just help me understand, not by service. Is that the sheriffs and the and the writs of possession? Is that the no. service? No. What, so what uh, yeah, it's a great question. So there's two ways you can start a civil action. You can either go to the court and give them your complaint and everything else that goes along with that filing. And then after you file with the court, you have 60 days to complete your service on the defendant. You have to get them all. Sorry, you have 60 days. Define complete service. You have 60 days after you file with the court to complete service on the defendant. That's one way to start a court case. The other way is that you can just send the, the defendant all of the stuff, the complaint and everything else by mail or by sheriff or um, in compliance with the rule, but you don't start by going to the court. You start by mailing it to the defendant and saying you are being sued in a civil action. So this says um, that second option is not available to you during the emergency period. You Got it. only initiate an action by filing it with the court. Got it. Thank you. That yep. was, <laughs> for those of us not steeped in this area of the law, mm -hmm. that was very helpful. Let me assure you that I am not steeped in this area of the law <laughs> and that I have relied heavily on Jean and Wendy and Angela and my judiciary compatriots, Bryn and Eric. And I think uh, I'm getting it right, but I you know, am always welcome to people tell me I'm getting it wrong. Well, and happily, we will hear from them in a moment. So <laughs> excellent. Any, uh, committee, any other questions on this new section? No. Okay, keep going. Okay, so subsection E at the bottom of 12, we are now going to address writs of possession that have not yet been issued, okay? So there are a couple of different circumstances in which under our statute, after the court decides who is entitled to possession of the property, they will issue this writ, which basically is the legal mechanism by which a, a owner is restored to possession of the property, legal possession of the property, whether it's by um, an ejectment action or a foreclosure action. But um, we're dealing in subsection E with a scenario where the court has basically reached its decision, but that writ has not yet been issued by the court. And so we're going to hit pause on the issuance as well. So under E, during the emergency period, a court shall not issue a writ of possession in three different circumstances. One, in an ejectment action pursuant to 12 VSA 4853AH because a tenant failed to pay rent into court, or B, pursuant to 12 VSA 4854 if the court has entered judgment in favor of the plaintiff but did not issue a writ of possession with a judgment. Let me stop there, say it back to you in plain English. If we're in an ejectment action, the court has decided that you will be ejected, but has not yet issued the writ of possession, giving the landlord the legal right to retake possession of that property. This act will hit pause on the issuance of that writ. Same thing in two and in three. These are both in the context of foreclosure actions and they both deal with the period of redemption, which is how long a person has to pay back the owed money and plus court costs and fees and filings and other things to quote unquote, redeem the property to avoid foreclosure. And if they fail to do that in the redemption period, then a court would issue a writ of possession. So as so, with- so, 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 Sorry, may I just ask in, yep. in two, so we shift from rent from a rental scene to an ownership scene. Yep. Okay. That's right. That's right. So, so uh, we're, one we're, deals with evictions and two deals with foreclosures. Right. Got it. So here we're moving into mortgages and and uh, right. Got yes. it. 
Um, all right. So if you're ready to move on and look uh, at F together, because it goes together, these are writs of possession that were already issued. Okay, so what happens if we went through the process, uh, the owner or the landlord has a judgment in their favor and an, a writ of possession has been issued. Under F1, during the emergency period, following a judgment in an ejectment or a foreclosure action, if the defendant was served a writ of possession not more than 60 days prior to the effective date of the act, the defendant is not required to surrender possession until the end of the emergency period and the sheriff or constable who served the writ shall provide written notice of the delay to that defendant. Under B, if a writ of possession was issued by the court but not yet served, the sheriff or constable shall not serve the writ and shall return it to the plaintiff. Under C, the courts in Vermont Legal Aid shall coordinate to ensure that defendants in ejectment actions receive notice of the delayed effective dates of writs issued by the court. And two, this is important, the effective date of a writ of possession is stayed as of the start date of the emergency period and resumes running when the emergency period ends. So, so, so this is uh, fairly important in terms of uh, uh, the immediacy with which we pass this because the emergency period began March 13th. That's correct. So this could all be actually happening as we meet here. And it is. So uh, this is the concern I have with, you know, when we, we just spent our all Senate meeting talking about remote voting. And this is, this is my concern is there is fallout of this emergency now happening now with people who need this help today. Is that- I think you can speak to that. Okay, sorry, we just lost your face. Uh, is my face back? Yes. Yes. Sorry, so, I'm, I'm negotiating a new setting in my house, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> is that the- Regarding is that the, possession is that, already yeah. issued. Randy. Uh, if the defendant was served the writ more than 60 days prior to the effective date of the act, what happens? Uh, then the normal, the normal process happens. They are directed to leave the property by the sheriff or constable serving that writ. And then um, there's a period of days and then the sheriff or constable comes back to execute the writ and ensure that they are removed from the property. Right. Okay. Well, and presumably that has already happened because that would have been two and a half months ago. We yeah, you know, you're going to have to look to people in the real world for how long this actually yep. takes. Right. Um, I, I don't, I need, that's what I will hope that we'll get from Jean and Wendy and uh, Angela. So, um, great. great. So, right. any other questions, uh, Becca, Cheryl, Randy? Thank you. No. Okay. And Allison, it looks like Michael has joined us again to listen in. Oh, great. Michael, it's good to have you present with us. Okay, so we are now at the top of page 14. Yes, uh, yeah, we're on 14 subsection G, resumption of rent escrow hearings. So um, this is looking ahead. The emergency period mercifully has ended and uh, rent escrow hearings may resume. Let me take one step back and refresh your memory on rent escrow hearings in 12 BSA 4850A several years ago. I think it's been uh, about 13 years maybe. You created uh, sort of an expedited hearing process for uh, certain eviction actions and the right of a landlord to file a motion with the court to order the tenant to pay rent in escrow into the court. And uh, basically, 
you have to pay the amount that uh, accrues as that action is pending, but also the amount of back rent that you owe since basically since the the, the civil action was begun. And, and the, co the court holds that until resolution? That's right. Um, if you don't pay rent into court as you are required, then you get, the landlord can get uh, a writ of possession that's good, I believe, within 14 days. So that's sort of the expedited process. Either you pay the rent that you owe or you lose possession. Um, so this subsection G is intended to create a temporary rule concerning how much rent can be paid uh, required to be paid in the court. Ah, got it. So remember that, or bear in mind, I suppose, that if this emergency lasts for six or nine months, and then at the end, rent escrow hearings resume, and a tenant shows up in court uh, on the tail end of this emergency period, he or she may be required to pay into court nine months of rent and then whatever accrues as it's ongoing. And for many people, obviously, uh, that will be impossible. So the purpose here is to limit, again, the amount that would accrue and be considered back rent and have to be paid into court. So under G1, for so, any period- Carol, did, you have a question? did somebody have a question? Okay, sorry. No worries. Under G1, for any hearing on a motion to order a defendant to pay rent into court that occurs within the first 45 days after the emergency period ends, if the court finds the tenant is obligated to pay rent and failed to do so, notwithstanding 4853 AD, the court shall order the defendant to pay into court A, rent as it accrues from the date of the order while the proceeding is pending, and B, Rent accrued from the date the motion was served, if the motion was served after the effective date of this act, or two, the end of the emergency period, if the motion was served before the effective date of this act. So that's part one. Let me say that back to you in plain English. Um, within the first 40 days after the emergency period ends, there's probably going to be a crush of hearings. And of those rent escrow hearings, we're going to create this temporary rule. Again, how much will the court make you pay into court for back rent? The answer is A, whatever is accruing while the proceeding is pending, and then B, rent accrued from a date certain. How do we determine what that date is? Well, it depends on when the motion was served. If the motion is served after the emergency period ends, basically because all service will have to be after the emergency period ends, then the accrual starts tolling from that date of service. However, if you served that motion before this act takes effect, essentially before the emergency period, then it tolls from the end of the emergency period. So that's the initial amount the court would require, and it would be less than otherwise applicable in Section 4853A. There's a well, second piece. How, I'm sorry, I hate to ask this, but how no is it less until you get to number two? Uh, well, because it's a shorter period of time. Um, okay. It's not, it wouldn't be from uh, you know, the date right. that the action was filed, which could have been March 1st, it will be from the date of service or the end of the emergency period, which hopefully will be, who knows, September, October-ish. Okay, but then, okay. Th then we offer the next option in number two, which is you could negotiate a reduced amount of rent. Well, uh, Negotiate in the sense that you ask the court to consider circumstances and it has the discretion to do so. Right. Um, so under two, the court may 
reduce the amount of rent the defendant must pay into court under subdivision one of the subsection after considering a the tenant's ability to pay due to circumstances arising in the emergency period and b whether the tenant made good faith attempts to secure available emergency rental payment funds so that will be a balance that the court would undertake and it would have the authority, though not the duty, to reduce the amount that would otherwise be required in subdivision one. After that 45 days is up, then we go back to the default rule in statute and proceed as normal. Any questions on that? So, David, is the intent of the uh, rule as it stands now to um, you're holding the rent in escrow to make the landlord whole and how does it differ then from what we'd be putting in place? Um, it does not. So the purpose of the statute as is written now um, is to require the tenant to pay back rent or be dispossessed. It's a it's an, again, it's it's basically an expedited process for non in the case of non-payment of rent, um, and it's to protect the landlord and it's to uh, have the money safely in the court and it's to ensure compliance by uh, both sides in the in the process of an ejectment action, and if the tenant doesn't pay, then the landlord will be restored to possession. The difference here is. Uh, twofold. First, the accrual period is shorter. And second, the court has some discretion to reduce the amount required, given the exigent circumstances of the emergency. And if the court isn't meeting, how are they making these determinations? Well, remember that this, uh, this would happen after the emergency period has ended. Okay, so all, okay, so all, all this will be past tense in terms of hopefully that somebody will be, I mean, conceivably one could be reemployed, but during that period they would have been laid off and it had reduced circumstances. Of, yeah. I mean, so that, but right. I mean, when I say this, I'm referring to subsection G. Some of the other pieces will have to happen during the course of the emergency period and the court will have to work that out. Right, and that's what we'll hear from uh, Judge Grierson in, in a bit. Okay. Great. Any further questions on subsection G? No, so this will, the, the, the court will have a notion, it will have, have real data as to what the tenant's financial circumstances were during the course of the emergency. So it, it yeah. The onus will be on the tenant to provide that information to right. the court. Okay, let's go to H. Okay, so H is uh, sort of a placeholder. Um, let me tell you, it's Providence. Uh, this, this bill has not really specifically addressed the situation of sort of emergency circumstances within the context of a, a landlord-tenant relationship. What happens if there is a person who is a tenant um, you know, that is violating the right of peaceful enjoyment of other tenants and it jeopardizes their health and safety. What do we do about that? Is uh, are the current emergency provisions uh, sufficient? Do we need to say something in this act? Uh, Champlain Housing Trust requested language and uh, Representative Stevens agreed to include it for the purpose of discussion. Therefore, I've included it in your draft. Right. Um, we I saw this, Chris, uh, in in an email from Chris. So this has actually gone through several uh, iterations, and in fact, there is other language under uh, review as of this morning. But let me just tell you. Let me read it. So you'll get the gist of what's going on. So, notwithstanding any provision of this act, landlord may commence, and a court may proceed with an action for ejectment based solely on the need protect the health and safety of one or more residents in the dwelling house or the building in which it is located. Um, so that's a very general approach. 
Uh, subsequently, stakeholders uh, recommended uh, a more targeted approach that a landlord could avail itself of emergency injunctive relief under the rules of civil procedure if there is um, either a material violation, excuse me, a material breach or a violation of uh, a landlord tenant law that results in uh, sort of uh, immediate substantial harm to other tenants. And then the plaintiff provides basically actual notice to the tenant that they are being uh, moved against for possession. Right, as, as I was thinking about this last night, I think that that's maybe a better approach. Uh, the other thing that's not addressed here that should be also part of that emergency injunctive relief, I think is, uh, is significant physical damage to the building. I mean, this, is, this contemplates only protecting the health and safety of one or more residents, but uh, what about protecting the integrity of the, of the physical space? I mean, if they're, if sure. they're trashing it in some significant uh, way, how do we yeah. protect the, the, from that? So I think that's a great point. Um, you know, the, the language that so far has been uh, around does not go that far. Um, in 4456 in Title IX, there's basically three tenant obligations uh, in A, B, and C. A is you can't contribute to uh, a violation of a health and safety or other kind of uh, regulation that governs the property. B, you can't disturb the right of quiet enjoyment of other tenants on the property. And C, uh, you, you can't uh, damage the property. I may have those misnumbered, but you get the point. Uh, right. Damage and property is one of the three. So, so uh, as we go forward, I, I would, I think want to also make sure that's included just because that could be a significant and um, that strikes me as a need for emergency relief too. Uh, well, that's a policy choice for you all. And I know that uh, stakeholders will have uh, thoughts on that. So I'll leave it to them. I'll, I'll say okay. lastly though, that the language that I've just been referring to, I you know, I saw an email this morning um, basically saying that that probably isn't going to provide that much relief uh, in this in these circumstances and it would be anyway I'm gonna so there's one more version that I'm gonna allow uh, others to address uh, but as you consider you know the extent to which you want to carve out exceptions to the blanket moratorium on ejectments right so right. this is the third one sorry I'm Randy sorry. Uh, David, you said there's a third alternative? Well, so that's right. I, 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 can I, well, I, just one moment. I'm trying to work with two screens here. And it's, uh, so it, as, as you are talking to us, you're also looking at another, I thought you just had one other possibility. You have a third? Yes. And I'm desperately trying to <laughs> pull it up and it's not working, I think, because I'm sharing. Okay, page. well, we're going to be working on this for the, again, so what, we don't want you drafting options as we talk. <laughs> no worries. Um, okay. Let me, let me just address the next. Why don't we, yeah, why don't we finish and then let's open it up. Sure. Right. So this, this goes to uh, documents that are being filed with the court. And right now you'll see in Title IV, um, electronic filing is available to a registered electronic filer in the judiciary's electronic document filing system. If you are a registered electronic filer, you may file any document that would otherwise require notarization without the notarization, provided that you include this statement. I declare the above statement is true and accurate for the best of my knowledge and belief. I understand if it's false, I'll be subject to penalty or perjury. And under B, a document filed pursuant to this subsection does not require the approval or verification of a notary. 
Uh, this doesn't apply to a search warrant or application to non-testimonial identification. So the change here in 27B is to extend the option of uh, filing documents with the court without notarization, basically to any party. Um, you may be aware there have been rules adopted by the Secretary of State's office on this subject, and the court has looked at this. My understanding is that they are complicated, um, and uh, this would just be a very simple blanket allowance to file documents without notarization if they include this statement. And only, and only for this emergency period? Mm, actually, no. So that's, uh, you know, that's something you could do. This would amend the law. Um, you could change this so it just says during the emergency period, a party may file without verification of a notary. So it, I would just say, given that I know that the Secretary of State office is working through the electronic notary uh, rules finally given that we passed that bill last year um, the and they are not uh, did you I didn't think they were set yet those rules are they David um, I don't know if they're final or not I, I, I don't either so to me to change the law completely and please everybody weigh in on this but to change the law at this point without those rules in place seems to be a little bit the cart before the horse, but I may be wrong on this and, and we'll hear from other people. Anybody else have thoughts on that? Well, all of the other changes in this bill pertain to the emergency period. Right. So it, well, I think- As they relate to housing, yes. And I think, Allison, that you have a point about having passed the, um, the law last year and the rules not being made yet, we should probably wait for that to happen to put it in, into law. But to use, to use this um, permission during the emergency period. Any thoughts, Randy or Becca? I'm inclined to limit this to the emergency at this point until we, we know more. Again, that, that's the focus of, of all the things we're doing right now is the emergency. My sense is we should leave it at that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I well, it's not left at, it doesn't mention it. So it would be, we'd have to add it in this section. I, I think we should. Okay, great. David, is that okay? Yes. Terrific. Um, yes, so we'll just make that for the emergency period only, yes? Great. So on, on that other piece, uh, I, I apologize for jumping around, but I was able to pull up my email um, and I can let, I can certainly let Angela and others speak to this more, but basically the proposal just would be um, to allow the emergency injunction relief that a landlord might seek in those uh, cases of, you know, safety, health, damage, whatever you decide the, the reasons are, it would be to allow those to proceed immediately when the emergency period ends rather than waiting the additional 30 days, excuse me, proceed once this, this, the, the declaration is issued that the state of emergency is over. So not the emergency period, but just the declared state of emergency. Those so, cases can start immediately. So I guess my question here is what if during the emergency yeah. uh, we have this kind of a situation where, I mean, where everyone is under so much tension and there's so much anxiety, you know, I can conceive of these situations happening during the emergency and in which the landlord would need to be conceivably removing a, a tenant who just had lost it altogether the, and who was a danger both to the rest of the community or to the to the physical space. I mean, is what is the opportunity for any emergency to happen during the emergency period? 
Well, I'm sure that I'm sure that they will, but um, you know, Angela correctly points out that already in the Chittenden and Washington divisions, they've essentially said they're not going to kick anybody out and even and so entertain these actions at all. Is, is there a judicial order other than Helen Tors? Uh, I haven't seen the one in Washington, but uh, you know it is up to the courts um, at the moment. Uh, what an emergency is and whether to take it up. And Chittenden is proceeding basically that they're not going to do right. it for any basis for this period. For 90 days. Well, if the emergency period lasts longer than 90 days, it 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 this is only help. Uh, Judge Torres is only for 90 days. So I guess that would be the the counter argument is that you know there are other divisions first and then second um, you know what if the what if it lasts a year you know um, which it could so I, I lots of stuff for you to consider and weigh I'm going to stop there unless there's further questions for me and allow other people uh, to weigh in on this uh, committee any questions now or shall we uh, go to our our witnesses to weigh in. I think go to the witnesses. Okay, anybody else? Have, okay, great. So uh, Jean, should we start with you and Wendy and then we'll uh, chat with Angela and then Beth, uh, we will weigh in with the commercial uh, aspect of it with Betsy and Sean. Okay, so Jean, it's welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm Jean Murray. I'm an attorney at Vermont Legal Aid. I practice in landlord tenant law and other kinds of um, things in the Superior Court in the Civil Division. And I appreciate your opportunity for me to tell you about why an eviction moratorium, a residential eviction moratorium is needed at this time. Um, this eviction moratorium that we've just covered in section nine of this bill addresses residential uh, evictions, and it's about public health. And the preeminent goal is to protect public health. Uh, dispossessing someone of their home during a time where it is impossible to find a new home makes a family homeless. And homelessness during a pandemic is a threat to public health, not just a threat to the people who are being dispossessed, but a threat to everybody else too. Um, so the governor's order says, stay home, stay safe. And so everybody needs to be in a home. Um, the courts of two counties, Washington County and Chittenden County, have issued a standing order deferring action on all motions for writs of possession for this reason, that it's impossible during a state of emergency to find a new home. Uh, and eviction would create homelessness. Um, about the two counties that have done standing orders, uh, what we're looking for with this bill is to have a consistent rule throughout the state. Um, right. So that it, whether or not a public health threat emerges because of evictions isn't a matter of which county you live in. Right. So the state of emergency has put some people out of work. And uh, the recently released housing needs study by the, I believe it's Department of Housing and Community Development has said that this year, half of the renting households in Vermont or some 36,000 households pay more than 30% of their income for rent. Um, and half of those, 18,000 households, pay more than half their income for rent. Did I say that right? Yes, and we, we, we got it. Okay. <laughs> um, so a reduction in income during a state of emergency um, will mean that for a while, some people will have a hard time paying their whole rent, but everyone will owe their whole rent at the end of the state of emergency. And so we are encouraging people to pay what rent they can. Um, there was a, a article in the uh, Burlington Free Press today. And that's the first thing I said to the reporter is people should pay what rent they can um, because they will owe the whole rent at the end. An eviction moratorium isn't about 
not paying rent. An eviction moratorium is about the public health issue of making sure that people have a home to stay in. Um, one of the things that I wanted to point out um, is that some landlords already receive a portion of their rent from a housing authority through a subsidizing, through subsidizing programs. For example, even a private landlord like Sisters and Brothers Investment Group, um, because they make many of their units available to tenants who have subsidies, um, either through housing choice vouchers or HOP grants or other subsidies, will continue to receive at least a portion of their rent, regardless of their tenant circumstances during the state of emergency, because they're receiving it from housing subsidizing agencies. Um, so, so Jean, what percent of, uh, uh, of renters receive direct uh, payment? I, I mean, I how, what, what percent of renters, do you have to be in section eight housing or what, what category of, uh, of rental assistance has that payment go directly to the landlord? You mean how many of the uh, 70, uh, 78,000 renting households receive subsidies? Well, uh, there, there are 78,000 renters who receive subsidies of some variety. No, 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 no. those are just renters. Well, uh, no, my question went to your statement about some uh, landlords receiving partial payment. Uh, so I'm asking what category of renter has uh, the part of their rent paid directly to a landlord? Do any. Do, do um, any. Oh, do, I thought are I they gender payments or is it, does it go to the tenant and then the tenant has to remit it to the oh, landlord? Of people, of landlords who receive a portion of their rent from a uh, subsidy in the, forget about state of emergency, in the regular case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I just said. Right, so if tenants uh, have a rental subsidy, the subsidy payment goes directly to the landlord. It never goes to the tenant and then to the landlord. The subsidy right. payment has always gone directly to the landlord. Got it, so, so I guess my question is, do we know what percent of the renting population has that happening at this moment? It, well, if you ask me, uh, not quite enough. Um, one of the things about uh, housing subsidies and support for low income housing is that the programs have changed um, a lot over the last uh, 10 years. And there are all sorts of very different and complicated arrangements. Um, it's really not that easy to keep up with. But one of the things that um, people know is there's a lot of people on waiting lists for subsidies and subsidized housing. So I would say, uh, I can't really give you a number of how many subsidies are out there. I Well, it's just, it's something to keep around in mind. 10,000, I would think, um, but, I, but I can find that out or get a better answer for you and give it back to you later, but. But, but that's good, I think, for us to know as we look at all this is that many landlords are getting direct payment and make not the whole rent obviously but some a portion of the rent is being paid directly through subsidy yes that's that is true and okay well that's good I, I i hadn't fully taken that on board maybe everybody else did but had but i hadn't i mean there are big uh like champlain housing trust that got mentioned here they are a big nonprofit landlord and their mission is to provide housing for low income um, people. And uh, one way they do that is to have lower than market rents, but another way they do that is to um, provide rental subsidies where the, where the tenant doesn't pay any more than 30% of their income for rent. Right. And so um, so they, they have their uh, subsidy money um, for the tenants that they have. Um, and then they're going to be looking to get rental payments from people. Um, and, they, and those people, if they've had a reduction in income because of reduction of work, 
they may not be able to make their entire payment. Right. Regardless of the situation, we urge tenants to be able to pay what they can because they're going to end up owing it at the end. Right. Um, so this, uh, just Jean, given our time frame this morning, the draft that we have before us, how are you and Wendy feeling about the draft at the moment? We, I wanted to talk with you about the emergency circumstances um, part. The, sec the section uh, eight, are you, a the section H? So you're, a, you're, you're, you're okay with it up to section H? Yes. Okay. Um, and if you have any questions um, about how it's supposed to work or what happens in the usual case or how this is different than the usual case, particularly if I get a copy of it in front of me, I can, I can explain it. Um, but so when you're thinking about extreme uh, circumstances, one of the things I, I would urge you to think about is extreme circumstances has got to mean where during a public health emergency, where it help, helps the public health more to remove someone than to let them stay. I mean, that's really a very high standard um, in favor of keeping people in their homes because regardless of what's happening, is it going to be a greater public health hazard to take somebody out of their home, which I would say almost always will be the case, or to leave somebody in their home? And like, I mean, not to be, um, flippant about it, but what if the tenant is, is having a meth lab in their home? That might right. modify moving somebody during the state of emergency. Beyond that, I don't know. There are already, for behaviorally disordered people, um, there are already emergency systems in place. Um, there are the police. There are the mental health system um, that can address um, people who need extra help or a different place to be um, in an emergency. So the, the section H language, which says it, it right now for me, the way it's, that's written, it's too broad because um, under this bill, regardless of section H, anybody would be able to file a case. They just wouldn't be able to take uh, move it through the court or, or get any um, hearing on it or any um, motion. So everybody be able to file a case. Um, the section H, the way it's written would say, hey, if the landlord believes there's a threat to health and safety, a landlord could move that case. And I think that's too broad. Um, the last thing we were talking about before this hearing started, um, was basically trying to figure out a way to say, okay, everybody gets to file cases no matter what the cause for eviction is, but at the end of the emergency period, um, use go to the four cause evictions, the ones where a tenant has breached um, the rental agreement or the Residential Rental Agreements Act and do those first. I think that's, that's what we're talking about, but um, we haven't had work that out yet. So does Angela, um, you may want to weigh in here. Uh, does it make sense before we spend more time on section H, does it make more sense for you to work out, uh, given that you've worked fairly productively so far, I understand on this together. Does it make sense for you to work on this section and then we can revisit it later in the week? Um, I'm, I'm, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. Um, I'm happy to, to do that. I know we have a few other voices who have been weighing in on this particular issue. And I think the proposal that was currently being made was to allow these breach cases to proceed at the end of the declaration to sort of not right. make them wait till the end of the emergency period, um, but to sort of kickstart them a little bit faster um, I think some of the issues that we've seen is uh, police, mental health advocates, 
are have not been effective even before this time frame in dealing with some of these issues that have been identified. Now, whether that's going to change given the circumstances, I don't know. Um, but there are some time frames where asking other tenants in the building to wait out this period of time with nobody being able to take action is going to be very difficult and challenging for those other residents in the building and potentially neighbors. I get that. And if there was a met, you know, and, and uh, yeah. So uh, how would you like, you know, I, I'd, I'd love to have people weigh in here on how they, uh, it, it, it strikes me that we need to find a balance between those, between the stakeholders. And I would, before the committee invests too much more time in, in, in going down a path that neither of you support. So Angela, you support the language as, as drafted in 8.1, I assume. I support the language, yes. I think that up to H. Up to <laughs> I H. think H is still the issue here. Oh, H is still the issue. So then before we invest too much more time, because our time today, sadly, is precious. Well, time is always precious for all of us. But, uh, I, you know, committee, tell me what you think. But I think the stakeholders may want to come to some uh, productive resolution on this before we weigh in too much more. Am I... Well, I would agree that, that it would be nice if we could come up with a balance that, that everyone could agree on. And if folks can't agree on it, then I think we want to look at what the alternatives are from a policy perspective that, right. that we, we want to deal with. So, But uh, I, I, I think that's a good point. I mean, but I think we'd like to have you guys weigh in on it together and see if you can come to agreement. And then if you can't, we'll, we'll weigh the options. Are there any other stakeholders on the call today who uh, want to comment on this? Uh, yes, I would like to. Are you Sean? I am. Hi, Sean. Would you be kind doing? enough to introduce yourself for the record? Sure. Um, Sean Handy. I'm a landlord in Chittenden County, Franklin County. Um, I have about 350 units that I um, look after. A um, couple of things that just caught me, I'd like to question a little bit. Um, something came up about a tenant's good faith effort. Um, how is that going to be determined if a tenant made a good faith effort while this is going on to pay their rent um, with the monies that you know they may be receiving? Um, or is there a way to possibly, you know, similar to how a, a housing subsidy pays a uh, landlord directly Maybe some of this, uh, I don't know if the federal unemployment uh, subsidy that's gonna be coming down is gonna be going through the state, if that is, um, using maybe LC-142s that have been filed by landlords to possibly help get some of that money instead of having it go through the tenant directly to the landlord to help with rent. Just an idea, I don't know what kind of bureaucratic nightmare that might create, but it's an idea. Um, I have a situation currently where I have a tenant that hasn't paid rent since November. Um, haven't, I finally got to court with them in March, beginning of March before all this began. Um, and I have a default judgment order ready to go to the judge that I know now will not be touched. They've been evicted twice before, before I rented to them. I didn't realize that obviously, um, I never would have rented to them. So. I'd like to see something where tenants that have a history of being evicted and are currently not paying their rent and looking to be evicted again, maybe some way to fast track that as well. Um, Cause that's not really fair to, to have that landlord knowing they're never going to pay and that landlord is never going to see a dime uh, from that person. Um, and as far as not being able to find housing right now, I can tell you personally, I'm, I'm still renting apartments. I'm still in my office every day. I still have people call me looking for apartments. I'm showing apartments and I'm renting apartments. Uh, uh, Sean, what, yes. what, what, percent of, what percent of your renters currently uh, have a direct subsidy payment to you? About, about 16 to 20 off the top of my head. 
most of my units are a little above price on what the housing agencies will pay because I do include all the utilities. They're very nice apartments, which is what a lot of landlords have moved towards. Um, so about, about 16 to 20. Are, are at, at uh, affordable affordable housing rates and, and get subsidies. Thank you. Um, and, and committee, any questions for Sean or for, um, because, and Judge Grierson has, wait, has joined us. Glad to see you, welcome. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I just don't, I think that um, it makes some sense for the stakeholders to come together and work on this section H before we weigh in fully on, 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 the, on, on a policy. If, if you can't come to an agreement and uh, because obviously the house is gonna be working on this tomorrow and uh, if, if you are able to work and present any changes for tomorrow, it would be great. Um, but we'll be working on this for a bit because we haven't even figured out how we're all remote, remote voting as bodies. So we need, at the moment, the plan is to have this passed by the House ASAP to come to us. Uh, but obviously we need to work out our, uh, how, we, how we actually accomplish that. Uh, Just a question to, to raise at this point, since uh, Judge Grierson is with us, we're talking in Section H about possibly uh, creating some emergency mechanism in which an eviction uh, can take place in an extreme circumstance. But we now have the orders uh, in Chittenden, Washington County that have effectively placed a moratorium on evictions. How, how would the court look at, let's say, an emergency situation that involved an eviction that did represent a health and safety issue, uh, at least from the landlord's perspective, or uh, the situation of someone operating a meth lab, which has not been shut down by the police. How would the courts deal with something like that uh, in the face of the orders that exist in Chittenden and Washington counties? Um, Senator, I, I, I'm trying to pull up the, the order that uh, was issued in Chittenden County and to, to look at it, but my recollection is, and I, I just saw it at the end of the day yesterday, um, I believe it still has a provision in there for um, emergency emergency requests, but I'll try to pull it up while we're talking. I think, I think it may be on our website. Uh, we were going to post it, I think today, and it may be up. You think it's on your committee? Is it on our website yet, Faith or Denise? Uh, no. Uh, excuse me, this is Denise, Senator uh, Clarkson. It is not up yet. Probably Faith is doing it as we speak because we were waiting for the okay. Right. I know you were. To post we're waiting. Yeah. We don't post things until we're discussing them. So uh, I believe it's what should be getting posted now, uh, Judge Grierson. I think I pulled it up, hopefully, on my other computer. So... Um, this is, uh, it's captioned uh, Vermont Superior Court, Chittenden Unit Civil Division uh, filed March 30th, standing order. The paragraph five says, uh, the court may extend, expand upon or reconsider this order as circumstances dictate. Any party seeking an exception to this order may file a motion supported by affidavit with a specific showing of factual circumstances. Right. And I, I have had a chance to speak with Judge Tour or the other orders that were issued, but that language to me um, so, so. would seem to give the opportunity, at least in response to the question that was asked, for someone to apply to the court and say, despite this standing order, this is a specific uh, circumstances that warrant the court intervening. That's that's clearly my interpretation of that order. Right. Uh, yeah. Agreed. That would make sense. Mm -hmm. uh, so back to section H. Uh, any. Uh, I, I think given that the uh, House is dealing with this tomorrow and they would love to have uh, some notion of your 
uh, how the stakeholders, I mean, obviously we're, we're getting a sense of how you're feeling about it at the moment, but the, I would, before we spend further time on it, I would suggest that you work together to come up with a balance that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Would that be okay? Senator, if you're, if I'm included in that group, <laughs> we, we've just seen the, um, the, or, the uh, bill last night. I'm still right. reviewing it with other judges. I will tell the committee that the primary concerns for the judiciary, at least at first glance, would be around cases uh, that are pending now, as opposed to those that may come in, um, that are new filings. And um, Mr. Handy uh, is the kind of situation that uh, we need to look closely at where, where matters already pending. And without going into a lot of detail, um, I, I was looking at, uh, assuming I've got the right draft here, it's 8.1 is what eight, I'm looking eight, at. 8.1. Right. So um, it talks about uh, on page 11, uh, section C, pending foreclosure and ejectment, um, starts out with essentially a moratorium. Um, I can tell you that when you start reading on pages 19 and 20 and, and on the following page, there's no way that we're going to be able to send out those notices in five days. Uh, we are operating on substantially reduced staffs. I don't have a date for you, but it's unrealistic. But more importantly, um, when you skip over to... Before you joined us, uh, Brian, I think we had we discussed that that might be unrealistic. It is. I can confirm that for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, the other issue is, I, I think as I read this this bill, though, there was broad language that said every order is is uh, is put on hold. And I just want to point out a couple of different situations that you can be thinking about. Um, uh, you're a little garbled. Okay. Um, I don't know why. Section 9C is what I'm looking at. Uh, 9C, which is on uh, top of page 14, the courts and legal aid. Let me find it. Pending foreclosure. The courts in Vermont Legal Aid shall coordinate to ensure that defendants in ejectment actions receive notice. Is that where you, what you're talking about? Yeah, it says all pending actions. I'm reading, it looks like on page 11, beginning at line 14. It, that's the, the essentially the moratorium language. Right, I'm pending. So when you talk about, if you'll see on line 17, it says, out, and outstanding orders. So a number of judges in reviewing this have said, well, what exactly do you mean by outstanding orders? Uh, for instance, if someone um, has is under currently under a pay rent into court order and they have been paying it, does that mean you want to suspend that order, which means they're their rent is just gonna to continue to accumulate. And when the uh, emergency period is over, they're going to have a substantially larger um, amount of rent owed. Um, by another example, in a foreclosure proceeding, if an order for sale of property has been ordered and the property is lying vacant and no one is in the property, then I would not think that you would want to just stop that Proceeding. These are just a couple of examples that, as we're looking at currently pending cases, I think it requires a closer look. And I'll try to have more information for either this committee or or the uh, so, House committee. Uh, Mike, so tomorrow the House committee is going to be taking this up, and uh, but those are good to flag at this at this moment. And any thoughts? Uh, my guess is David Hall would appreciate getting. Um, and the, uh, hmm, I don't know where to take it. The, those are, <laughs> I would assume we would want the outstanding order if it required reduced rental payment to continue because you're right. Otherwise the balloon will just get bigger and bigger. 
Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> but our given our t given our time frame and our challenge on shortness of time today, uh, could we charge the stakeholders on both on the uh, particularly on Section Eight? The pending foreclosures, my guess is, Judge, you can directly deal with tomorrow. Is that with the uh, House Committee? I believe, um, I think I'm scheduled to testify. I have to look. I think you are. I think you are. Okay, and, thank but you. I, but I'm pretty sure the House would appreciate some uh, consensus, if it's possible, uh, with the stakeholders, Sean and Angela and Jean, to, for tomorrow, if, and working with David, if there was language that you could come, in, uh, come into agreement on. That I think would really be beneficial because I think all of us are trying to get this done as quickly as possible, given that these are cases happening now. And uh, we need to move this legislation ASAP, in my humble opinion. And uh, I'm sure in everybody else's too. Sure. And, and I'm certainly willing to work with all the folks involved to see if Great. we can. And you've been in, uh, great so far. We've gotten this far, which is terrific. Um, so I, is there anything else we want to chat about before this, before we move on to our next update? Just Any something to keep in mind, uh, in the back of our minds, we're dealing with these sections on eviction. Right? So as we look at this particular bill, section eight includes uh, specific funding, emergency relief funding to include among other things, financial assistance for security deposits and rental payments. So the, the, the notion of uh, putting things in hold in suspension, a financial harm somewhere along the line, uh, we do need to think about these particular uh, items such as financial assistance can be also play a role in this in order to bridge the gap. Absolutely. And I think we'll understand more as we do a fuller analysis on the federal relief package of what what is available for exactly this kind of thing. And I'm, I'm, I think we're getting into some clarity on that. Jean and uh, and Angela, are you getting are you understanding more fully the impact uh, of some of the money that was put in for exactly these kinds of uh, relief in the federal package? I don't, yet. I don't think we have a, yeah, I don't think we know yet. Okay, so we're getting that analysis and my, my guess is we'll all be clearer on that in the next couple of days. Uh, David is, I'm sure getting, not David Mickenberg who's here, but David Hall who's here somewhere. Uh, it, I'm, I'm sure we're gonna get a better sense of that by the end of the week. Are so, you asking I, that I prepare a summary of the provisions yeah. of the CARES Act? <laughs> No, nobody I, had said that until now. No, I think that we, particularly given sections eight, uh, uh, we seven and eight, we need to begin to get a sense. Uh, and Damien has done this obviously on UI, and I'm sure all of you are beginning to do this, but that may be an assumption. Uh, we need to have an understanding of the federal, uh, of the impact of the federal relief in terms of housing as it relates to section seven and eight? Well, one of the things that we can see in looking at section eight of, of this draft is it does include things that are directly relevant to the problem, including rental arrears, short term yep. rental, mm -hmm. and so on. Now, exactly. what's clear to us at this point though, is whether or not this is our bill that relates to DCF or whether this piggybacks off something contained in the federal act, the details of which we don't know yet. And so exactly. That is critically important for us. Right. We, we uh, so, yeah. This is Betsy Bishop. And I know you folks are trying oh. to wrap this section up. Betsy, I apologize. I, you know, isn't it terrible? The visual cue of not seeing you. I, you're right here to chat and we very much want to, uh, hear what you have to say, so I apologize. It's fine, and and I think I can help you with your time frame as well. 
So um, I think most of what you've been talking about is certainly rental housing, mostly uh, for the individual and the residential. I think what I was asked to do was give you a understanding of what's happening in the commercial sector. Uh, the bill that you have before you and that the House will be working on tomorrow is really not um, addressing the commercial sector. And frankly, I'm not sure that it can, but um, I thought it might be helpful if you would, if you would, just to hear a little bit about what's happening in the industry uh, right now with the commercial leases. Uh, and it's not very much unlike what you're talking about on the residential sides. Uh, the answer is yes, and uh, that means we'll just be a little late for the update on uh, workers' comp, but I think this is important because this will tee up the work that we will be doing because we'll, any response on the commercial side is something we'll be doing when it comes to the Senate, so we'll be uh, preparing for that now. So that, it, Betsy, if you could do that briefly, that would be great. Yeah, and, and I think I can, and um, specifically what will help you with your time frame is I don't have a uh, grand solution for you to insert into this bill. So this is more information in for you. Um, but uh, the commercial properties, as you can imagine, as the economy has sort of stopped, if you will, as businesses are, have been ordered to close, revenue is not coming in. Uh, and the federal bill that has been discussed and that has trillion dollars is not designed to help businesses as much as it is designed to help people. So it, you know, as people are being laid off from work, um, there's- Sorry, somebody needs to mute themselves. We're hearing some interference. Okay, hopefully that's better. Um, is that all right? Yes. Yep, okay. yep, you're, you're fine. So, um, you know, one of the things that we're hearing quite a bit about is uh, the SBA loans that are coming to help businesses, and that's the predominant right. effort. To be very clear, that is a additional loan capacity. It is not cash for businesses. And you're only going to get that type of help in that loan if you have a business that was prior to um, prior to the COVID-19 issue. So a lot of businesses are really looking at that as uh, potentially not helpful uh, because it's just taking on more debt at a very uncertain time and there's no revenue coming in. So- um, Right, and, and we'll, be, we'll be dealing with those later. The, the PPP program could conceivably be more helpful as it converts to a grant if you abide by all the things you agree to during the course of it. Right, so true. Um, obviously the terms for converting to grant are not uh, particularly uh, clear. Uh, and some it's of It's not clear yet only, at all. Again, only if you're reopening and rehiring everybody. So um, that's making a huge leap of faith. So one of the things that is happening right now is you know, a lot of businesses are really trying to figure out how do they last through this? Is this a 30 day problem? Is it a 60 day problem? Is it a 90 day problem? And the longer it goes on, the same things that you're talking about for the people of Vermont are going to happen to the, to the businesses of Vermont because they are the people of Vermont. So mostly what we've heard first and foremost is from the restaurant sector because that was the sector that was closed first but we're seeing that from certainly the traveling uh, hoteliers as well as retail right throughout the state. Um, and as it just, as it pertains to rent, which is what we're really focusing on now, the commercial rent, restaurants, a huge percent of restaurants rent. Most of the businesses I've heard of that are having a challenge with meeting rental obligations are all restaurants. Yes, um, mostly because they're a leasing. And so it's the same, it's commercial rent, the, the lease portion of that. And most of those contracts, I think you brought up earlier, are private in nature. Right. Uh, and the, the thing that is not known completely that um, we've been looking at more and more is many of those lease arrangements in the commercial sector must have personal guarantees on them. Right. And those personal guarantees are what's going to crush the business owner. Um, and so if you can imagine uh, a business owner perhaps thinking that they cannot reopen, uh, they are still going to be personally liable for the length of that lease. And that is where the 
the crushing ability to emerge from this is going to be a problem. So I think that's something that we're looking at. Um, a lot of folks in the commercial sector have been talking about force majeure and whether or not this would be a um, instance for that, whether this is an unforeseeable uh, circumstance or um, whether that was um, unavoidable. Mostly that has to do with natural disasters and that. Uh, sorry, I, I just have to interrupt. Somebody sounds like they're preparing lunch in the background. I, I mean, that's yeah. great, but we don't want to hear it. <laughs> so whoever is making a lot of preparatory noises or people, that would be great. Thank you. Um, sorry. It's, we we can maybe we can do a Zoom call on what we're all eating for lunch a little bit later. <laughs> right. So uh, we, th we, we need to move on at this point, but I, Betsy, your points are really well taken and it's an issue we are wanting to take on and one that we will be addressing. And David, uh, we're gonna need your thoughts on this. Betsy, we're gonna need your thoughts and anyone else on the commercial lease, uh, how we provide relief in any substantive way in these private contracts is a, 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 a challenging question. And Judge I'm, not, Pearson, I, you I'm not really sure that you can. I just will leave you with one thought. There are um, banks and uh, landlords are, we are seeing their flexibility show up. Um, we, I talked to TD Bank yesterday and for anybody who is at a million dollars or less in uh, loan payments, they are doing almost automatic email um, uh, delays for three to six months at, a, at an ask. So they're being, a lot of banks are being flexible. A lot of landlords are as well. So right. we're seeing some, the question is how long does it go on? So right. I'll leave it there. Um, we've got lots of suggestions, not sure how they'll actually fit into the law, but we'll, we'll work with, through that. Great. And more, more to follow because this is a big, a big issue. If it's okay with everybody, I think we're going to finish the eviction uh, discussion uh, Sean and Angela and Jean and Wendy and uh, Judge Grierson, I would hope that we could, uh, in tomorrow's discussion with the House, move this forward and come into some kind of agreement, if it's possible, on Section H. And Judge Grierson, I w we wish you well tomorrow as you uh, look at the, the pending work uh, in, in, uh, on page 11. And we will look forward to hearing how that discussion goes tomorrow. Oh my. Yeah. Thanks a million. All Thank right, I'm going. Everything. And uh, so now we're gonna move to David Mickenberg and Stephen Monahan and the work uh, or workers comp update. I'm leaving. Sorry, our our Thanks, time is, uh, uh, is challenged and uh, we will be coming back to all of this. Thank you very much for everybody who's participated. Jean, thanks a million. Sean, thank you. Great. David and Steve. Steve, are you on? Uh, trying to unmute here. Can you hear me? We can yeah. hear you. We can't see you, but we can hear you. Okay. Yes, hey. I, I um, held a large conference call yesterday, about 22 participants. Uh, attorneys representing claimants, um, attorneys representing uh, the defense bar, um, and some lobbyists representing insurers, and David Mickenberg uh, were all present. Um, I received a lot of feedback. There wasn't actually a lot of agreement, but based on the feedback I received, I prepared a uh, memo that I'm having my staff review right now that I expect will be issued today addressing how we apply our Rule 12 discontinuances provisions in workers' comp. The problems we're facing, as we alluded to the other day, are that claimants, claimants have difficulty getting treatment, insurers have difficulty obtaining independent medical exams, um, and we're concerned that uh, insurers may seek to discontinue benefits to workers who have little ability to provide countervailing evidence. So those are the things that my uh, instructions to staff that we'll be distributing later today will be. Great. 
And so perhaps, uh, uh, I think then we wait and look at that later when we meet on Thursday. Uh, that that's, that's possible. If we were to consider any legislation, then I guess I would say something simply that gave the department some authority to waive certain statutory provisions uh, in the event of a pandemic. Um, so it wouldn't. And then, and then we could go from from there. The Constitution appears to provide that uh, the executive can't, branch can't waive statutory provisions without uh, authority granted by the legislature to do so. so. That's if if anything were done. But I I would say let's see how this um, bulletin that I'm going to issue um, starts to play out. First. Okay, and. David, is, that's that. How does that work with you? Um, well, it was a good productive call yesterday. Uh, appreciate all the work that Steve's doing on this and others, um, and look forward to seeing the memo. Yes, we think we agree that many many of our concerns are in Rule Twelve, but I just want to flag one thing. We had we had come into the conversation yesterday, many in the claimants bar and the labor community talking about a moratorium on discontinuances, meaning just an, uh, a full stop on discontinuances so that benefits would continue for claimants. So given the hurdles that they're facing, uh, an idea that surfaced and it would have to be a statutory fix and in continuing conversation with the department would be, right now the default is once a discontinuance is filed, you get one week the possibility of adding another, but essentially you are terminated from benefits and then you have to adjudicate your claim to try to restore those benefits. Um, one idea would be to sort of swap that to say benefits would continue until they've been adjudicated. And that would have to be a statutory uh, provision. Maybe it's what Steve was alluding to in terms of giving the department some discretion in certain circumstances to allow for that but that would be something that that given given the obstacles um that claimants are facing uh in terms of establishing that their benefits could, should continue whether it's going to see a doctor getting medical records uh and it would just be for the pendency of this emergency um but uh allowing those benefits conti to continue until the department has time to weigh the evidence um so that's one just flagging that as a potential uh, statutory um, uh, uh, fix or statutory piece that you all would need to, to weigh in on. Uh, cool. Important during this time for, and I just say, it's not just yesterday, there were many uh, attorneys representing the plaintiffs and the defense bar, but the vast majority of the, I think 9,000 claims a year uh, uh, of workers' comp claims people go unrepresented so for many of them those 16 to 17,000 16 to 17,000 even more thanks Steve um, so for <laughs> those folks That's to have to, for those folks to have to within a week they get one week one more week of benefits or potentially two to have to navigate uh, not only the workers comp system but also the medical system to try to seek uh, an opinion from their physician or other opinions and records to try to adjudicate their claim is very difficult, especially if they don't have the, an attorney and the vast majority of people do not. So, so it looks, uh, so it sounds like uh, Steve's going to do, finish this memo, you'll look, review it and uh, come with recommendations as to actions we may have to take uh, as soon as possible. That's the, right. Where yep. the legislature will have to weigh in. Yes. Okay, great. So when we meet Thursday or Friday, we will hope that we'll have clarity on that to uh, if we, is that too soon? Is Friday, if we put you into our Friday meeting, would that uh, make some sense? Would that give you enough time to? It's fine from my perspective. We've, we've sort of done our analysis and can share that with, as we started to yesterday right. with Steve and others. So it's fr Thursday or Friday is fine. From our perspective. I'm happy to provide an update. I would like uh, possibly longer to see if this uh, bulletin that I hope to put out today will actually solve 
any of the issues, which, okay. which in the, which in you know, in two days we wouldn't be able to get a good sense of that. So, and this, uh, and this is Betsy Bishop. I just have to say that if we're going to change how this is done, there's a different way of doing that, and that might be just extending that week during the the pandemic instead of flipping. The entire burden of proof with it, which is a much larger issue. So that's something that we would like to be involved with as well. Right. Okay. And I, I would say just just to be clear, under the existing law, discontinuances, uh, the the burden of proof is on the insurance company, not on the individual when they seek to stop the benefit. So so we're not shifting the burden of proof. We're simply explaining what must be shown. Uh, in order to proceed. So we're not stopping all discontinuances entirely. Um, we're just saying what has to be provided uh, under these circumstances in order to proceed to discontinue. Got it. The, yeah, the issue is under the current regime, statutory regime, the default is you have a week and then you're cut off. Mm -hmm. And then you have to adjudicate your claim. So the idea would be to extend that until right. you can adjudicate the claim. So, but, uh, Steve, you're uh, in your bulletin. You can you can extend without legislative action, couldn't you? Uh, well, that's not entirely clear be, that we could extend beyond the provisions in the statute. We might, if we felt, we might weighing the evidence conclude that there was insufficient evidence and that would continue the benefits. That's the purpose of the staff's review of got, the, got it. Of so the if case. we if we took this up Tuesday, would you have time would you feel that would be adequate time to see if your bulletin actually solves most of the problem? Well we'd certainly have some uh, time to look at some cases to see how it had applied. Okay. And, uh, so that I think that's a a fair effort to, to try to try and go down that path first uh, and then so why don't we end up get why don't we schedule this again then for Tuesday is that okay with you David sounds good to me yep okay Steve okay great thank you very much um, and we will thank you for your work on that and that call that sounds like it was productive thank you yeah thank you. Good, good work um, do we have Commissioner Harrington on the phone? Uh, good, good morning, Senator. I'm here. Great. Welcome. And I see Damien has joined us. Uh, Commissioner Harrington, <laughs> the beleaguered department, we are uh, all thinking of you. Uh, yeah. Today, in preparation for our meeting on Thursday, where we're going to be addressing some of the challenges you face, <laughs> some of the challenges we face together, um, would you be kind enough just to give us an update on, on where you are, where you're seeing some of the needs for action as we look at the federal relief in the uh, CARES Act, whether that's hindering or, I mean, whether it's it's creating some additional challenges, at least some that we're hearing about. And we would just love to have you weigh in, give us an update, and then maybe hear some of the challenges we're hearing about, which I'm sure you're hearing about as well. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you for the time and for the record, Michael Harrington, Interim Commissioner, Department of Labor. Um, thank you, Senator. Uh, it is a trying time for many, uh, and especially in the unemployment insurance world. Um, you know, I, I fully am aware of the struggle that the public is having right now in terms of um, getting in contact with somebody or helping to move their claim along. Um, you know, across New England and across the country, states you know, this is unprecedented in every state in terms of the spike in unemployment insurance claims. And so um, unlike other states, we have been able to keep our phone lines open and continue to serve the public. But, you know, it's not, um, it's not like being able to flip a switch and all of a sudden be able to double, triple, or quadruple your capacity for calls. And so there is a backlog and we are aware that people cannot get through. Um, 
How, how are done. you doing, Michael? How are you doing on staffing? Are you are you staffed to to the max for the call center? Yeah. So so what we've done is actually um, redirect staff that already are, are existing in the department that have. Uh, intimate knowledge of the UI system and redirected them to the phone lines. Um, there's an added component of complexity there because uh, most of these people are working remotely. Um, we will have a need down the road to add staff. Um, we're trying to work out the logistics right now about how do you how do you onboard somebody when um, when the entire process is remote, right, or telework based. Uh, and are there opportunities for us to continue the same training model we had? Um, the, just so you have an idea of, um, you know, what I'm talking about is that um, there, the people who are taking the calls um, that are actually processing claims are called unemployment insurance merit staff. Uh, they've been certified as such by the federal government um, and, uh, and have gone through an intensive four-week training process both to understand the unemployment insurance program and the rules and regulations around that, but also how to navigate our mainframe system. Um, so clearly we, we cannot continue to maintain a four week turnaround on training. So we're trying to, to shorten that or truncate that as much as possible, but also trying to figure out how do you, how do you pair somebody up with somebody, have them take calls together, have them work in the mainframe system together? How do we get them to learn about the UI and the rules logic that comes along with um, answering a call? And if the caller says this, then the answer is this or the direction is that. Um, so we are we are working on that. We're kind of in a temporary overflow state right now in terms of staff. Uh, handling calls, but we'll eventually have to move to a more sustainable model um, because many of our staff will have other jobs in the UI division that they have to get back to, to in order to ensure program integrity. Um, we did uh, create an online um, form that people can fill out to at least initiate the claims process right. and get started. Um, and, traffic and on that there. Are you now Go what ahead. percent? What percent uh, are coming in by from the online versus the call center? Uh, certainly, the majority is online. Um, you know, but we're talking um, in terms of the overall um, universe of impacted individuals of you know tens of thousands of people, if not more. So trying to um, so even when we say you know, most of it's being done electronically, even a percentage of that that's going to our call center still overloads us. Um, and so, so we are, yeah. go ahead. No, I, I, I'm just oh. thinking it's still thousands of people that have to be processed, no matter how it comes yeah, into right. you. Well, and, and as you, I'm sure you know, because um, you've just lived in, in the world of, of the department and the legislature long enough. Many of you have that. Um, you know the UI system is not a is not an easy system. It's a complex system, and and many times when um, you know it's not as straightforward as people think. So even when someone's submitting an online form, there may be issues uh, or things that hold up that claim. And so when we're talking about tens of thousands of claims, we're then talking about probably. Um, you know, thousands and thousands of issues that come up on a claim because it wasn't filled out correctly or it had missing information or we weren't able to match the employer with the, the claimant. And so those all require a uh, hand-to-hand -hand touch in terms of somebody resolving the issue on the claim to be able to move it forward for processing. Um, we have started uh, issuing um, payments for uh, COVID-related claims uh, that started over this past weekend and, and into this week. Um, what people need to realize too, though, is that you may say, well, that seems like a long time since when this first happened. Just remember that for the you're always filing for the week you're coming. So in, in those terms, um, some of the people who opened up a claim last week could only file for the first time beginning this Sunday. The right. people who are impacted, um, the people, because of the delay, 
um, with the, the massive volume we had. The people who were impacted during the week of March 15th, the first time they could actually file a, a, a weekly claim was uh, this past Friday. So again, we're as soon as we are moving through the process as quickly as possible, we're already starting to issue payments. Um, and the fact is that many of these weekly claims have only been in our system for, for a couple of days. Um, so, so, so the one thing we're going to want to be chatting with you about on Thursday, uh, there are a couple of things. One is how is the UI money for self-employed going to flow? How are you thinking of setting that up within DOL? Uh, I also think that there are a number of concerns being voiced about the $600 uh, uh, federal relief that is going to be on yep. top of their UI claim. And I think for many people, there's a major concern that this is a disincentive to work because they're going to be being paid substantially more than they were being paid when they left their work uh, and or given our our uh, opportunity that we created in the bill to voluntarily leave your work, that there is a major concern from employers that people will be leaving their work, claiming unemployment and getting this $600 benefit, uh, creating a situation where they're gonna be earning much more on unemployment than they would have if they'd stayed working even in an essential job. So I think those are some of the things that we're gonna really wanna be addressing on Thursday. Do you have any initial thoughts on those? Yeah, let me speak to these just briefly. So first of all, know that the, 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 we certainly understand the provisions in the act. What we are still waiting on is the actual administrative guidance from DOL in terms of how these programs are administered. That doesn't mean we're not moving forward. We are already starting the process of how we would implement these. Um, like the $600, we have a mechanism um, already for how we will implement the $600. Um, there's other benefits uh, such as extended benefits. So if someone exhausts um, their 26 weeks of benefits, there's a mechanism for extended benefits through the federal relief package. There is relief for um, government entities and other nonprofits in terms of what their experience rating would be if they had to lay off. Um, and uh, the big one, I think, like you mentioned, is what's being called pandemic unemployment assistance, which really speaks to the self-employed or independent contractors and, and how that would work. And we're, we're looking, that's gonna be a heavier lift for us than, than anything else, um, because uh, when we had disaster unemployment assistance during Irene, um, it was in, in comparison to the situation we face today, a relatively small confined uh, experience. And so the people who were impacted, um, you know, the, were not at the magnitude in terms of numbers as they are now. And so we were able to manage that program manually um, through paper claims, um, but this certainly is not something we could do. So we're actually probably going to be seeing if we can partner with other departments in state government like Department of Taxes or something like that could, that could help um, with the administration of that depending um, you know a lot of a lot of the restrictions we are are finding ourselves in right now are um, technology related um, so if there's um, other systems out there that can help us through that um, we would certainly will we will be looking at all options let's put it that way Thank you. Uh, so the administrative guidance from the feds is still not in place on, on many of these programs that they have excited the public about, but that are not yeah. yet readily, readily available or rolled out, uh, which is important for us all to remember it, uh, is, uh, yes, because once, of course, it's discussed in the press, everyone thinks it's immediately available, which, yeah. which is a challenge. Yeah. And I, I should say, like the, for instance, with the $600 um, that was in the program, that while it may not be, um, people may not begin to realize or see that money, um, you know, for the next week or so, uh, it will be backdated at the start of uh, March 29th. So it, it will be retroactive to this week. Um, but 
they may not see it for the next week or two, depending on claims filing and, and federal guidance. So do you committee, do you have any questions? I mean, because I know Randy and I, and I know a couple of yeah. us have heard about this disincentive to, you know, if people with this $600 addition are going to be earning so significantly more than they, so much more than they were earning, is there a way for us to, uh, to review what, what the, what our, what we actually pay? I mean, so right now, Michael, is it 53 or 57% of their income that they max out at? Um, it's not a it's not a clear percentage, but there is a there is a 50 percent disregard along with some other factors um, that determines their their wage uh, or their benefit, I should say. Um, so it's you know maximum is five hundred and thirteen dollars. Um, but, you know, someone unless you're in the um, very low end of the pay scale, um, you know, close to the minimum wage, most people will max out their benefits with the maximum amount unless they were part time or unless they were earning, um, you know, much closer to the minimum wage level. So on Thursday, because I'm cognizant of our time being almost up on Thursday, we will really appreciate a, a deeper dive into the interplay between what we're offering in our UI program at the moment and what the bill we just passed and the additions of this pandemic relief and assistance. and a better understanding, so that's one, the additional understanding uh, about the, you know, self-employment and independent contractor, that's another. Anything else committee that we wanna make sure that Michael's prepared for for Thursday? I would like to see some, uh, just one or two clear examples of how this would work in practice with employees at particular wage levels based on what we know. Uh, one of the concerns that's been frequently expressed by businesses is that one, it may be more difficult to get people to come back to work because of the additional federal money. In other words, the sense that they would be earning more than they would if they came back to work, which may or may not be true. Uh, and secondly, in during this interim right now, where there are lots of jobs available for people who are needed during the crisis, uh, whether or not uh, the, the amounts of money that would be paid out would be disincentives for them to go off unemployment and come back to work. Okay, and so we'll. So uh, I, I don't know if you were looking for comment from me, um, Michael Harrington, uh, Department on that, uh, but I, I, it, I, is, it is going to, yeah. I think just given our time frame today, I think committee members are just voicing areas we really want to address on Thursday. Is that right, Correct. Randy? That's correct. Yep. Yeah. Great. Any, Cheryl Great. or Becca? Uh, Cheryl, we can't hear you, my dear. We still can't hear you. There's a lot left to be understood. So I, yeah. I guess, you know, we'll wait until Thursday and see if we can get more information. Um, one of the problems or issues that was brought to me was people being asked to go back to work. I don't know how that interplays with the um, stay at home order. Uh, and maybe the commissioner could com comment on that <coughs> later on. Great on uh, on Thursday, Becca. Do you have anything that to, for uh, the commissioner to think about before Thursday? I think it makes sense, Allison, for us the the committee to generate a list of questions mm -hmm. for Commissioner Harrington so that I, I he's agree. got them in in front of him. And so I'm making a list here, but I don't think we need to do it now. Great, terrific. So um, Senator Clarkson. Yeah. Uh, if I can just interrupt, as you're considering options in the next few days, I just want to note that the federal act provides that the state would become ineligible for the additional $600 pandemic unemployment uh, enhanced benefit if it modifies its maximum weekly benefit to make it less or modifies its formula to diminish the average weekly benefit under the state plan. Okay. Ah, so we so are not allowed to diminish our benefits and use the, um, in light of the enhanced federal benefit. So any options we consider um, have to take into account the non-reduction rule that's included in the federal act. 
That's and I'm happy to speak to that in more detail on Thursday. Great. <laughs> Let's as we create our agenda, that is uh, that will be a key update uh, and under better understanding of that. So, uh, Commissioner Harrington, we're pl we're planning on meeting at nine thirty on Thursday. Are you would you be available to join us then for about a, you know a, a, an hour? Uh, I will put it on my calendar, but I'm also thinking I may include uh, UI Director Cameron Wood and Dirk Anderson, our general counsel. Um, so even if it's not me, um, it, it may be both of them, uh, only Great. because they are they can right. speak to more the specifics. Great. That, that would be terrific, because I think we're going to be devoting at least the first half, probably the first hour and a half of our meeting to uh, UI and more fully understanding this. So uh, unless there's something else, committee, I think we're done for today. I thank you for your patience <laughs> and good work and um, more to follow. But we meet next Thursday morning at 9.30. And Any taking you off live YouTube now. Okay, Faith, thanks a million. <laughs>